Hello, and welcome to Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you for joining us. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. If you're not sure what a state controller does, the short answer is that I'm the Chief Fiscal Officer for New York State. That includes everything from reviewing government budgets, auditing state and local spending, and government operations to managing the state's $186 billion pension fund and a lot more. Today, I'll be talking with Richard Ravitch about New York's need for updated infrastructure, bridges, highways, water systems, and so on, and the challenges the state and localities face in financing those projects. I'll also be discussing Lower Manhattan with newly elected Assembly Member Yulene Nu. We'll hear about her priorities for her district. But first, let's talk about the challenges facing New York's infrastructure. The New York Times has referred to Dick Ravitch as New York's Mr. Fix-It. As a veteran of more than 50 years in government and in the private sector, he's been called on to solve some of our most intractable problems, from saving New York City from default, to saving our transit system, to helping Major League Baseball come up with a revenue sharing plan. Dick, your resume is long, it would take up the whole show, but I'm so honored that you would join us, and uh, I appreciate your good counsel and advice that you've given me in my role as state controller, and I appreciated the time to really get to know you when you served as Lieutenant Governor for the state of New York. You are known as the person who is involved with so many key issues. There's a lot of talk going on right now about the issue of infrastructure, certainly a state like New York that's an older state, many issues in that regard. The new administration is talking about it. Could you share with our viewers your perspective, where are we at with infrastructure in New York City and New York State, and what's your reaction to some of the proposals that are floating out there to deal with it? I think there's a broad recognition that the well-being of our infrastructure is critical to our economy. Uh, and the public infrastructure has always suffered from two facts. One, that unlike private enterprise, depreciation is not an expense in government accounting or government budgeting. So there's no way of tracking in any formal arithmetic way the physical deterioration of the assets that are essential to, to people moving. It has tended to be programs that have responded when situations have become close to dire or critical, uh, like the New York City subway system descended into chaos in the, in the 70s. Um, I think everybody recognizes that the problem uh, is that politicians don't like to uh, seek revenues in order to finance infrastructure. And without taxes or user charges, the rest of it is purely illusory or aspirational. We have a, a $29 billion MTA capital plan uh, that was issued two years ago, and I believe it's accurate to say there's only $2 billion of it has actually been financed. And there are a lot of very bold, exciting proposals out there, uh, but uh, I haven't heard anything since we created, um, with your support, back in 2008, a, a insignificant, a three basis point uh, um, payroll tax, which provided the revenue to support billions of dollars of, of MTA capital expenditures. You have so, a similar challenge with the Thory Authority, right? The Tappan Zee Bridge, which is going up, but the, the, the full uh, explanation of the financing, how it's going to be paid for is still not been expressed. That's correct. Yeah. Nor do we know what the tolls yeah. will be. Yeah. Um, and it takes, uh, frankly, takes people in public life like yourself who are willing to say, hey, we got to raise tolls or we got to raise fares or we have to, to raise revenues. In, in the early 80s, the entire business leadership in New York City, David Rockefeller, Walter Riston, Dick Shin, the head of MetLife, they went to Albany and supported the tax package that uh, Governor Kerry and I had put before the legislature uh, to finance the rebuilding of the New York City subway system and, and Metro North as well, which we had just created. Uh, I, I don't see the kind of civic engagement anymore on the part of the business community um, or even to some extent even amongst my, uh, my friends in the labor movement mm. uh, on behalf of the things that are essential to, for yeah, the you, growth. You've been an expert on the issue of fiscal stress facing local governments. You've, you've been involved with helping to save Detroit, Puerto Rico and so on. 
given all the stress that, that, that you've documented over the years that local governments have been facing, it's clear that at the local level, the money and the resources aren't there to deal with all of these infrastructure needs. I mean, we, we were talking about roads and bridges and transit, but water is a big issue now. Water infrastructure, we just put out a report conservatively estimating you need about $40 billion you know, over the next few years. So with the constraint on local government and to a certain extent state government, do you hold out any um, hopeful expectation that with what the new administration is talking about that the federal government will become more of a player to help finance these local uh, and well, state the, projects? The new president has said he is going to do it. We have not yet seen any content to the proposal. Uh, I would say the American Society of Civil Engineers, the <clears throat> public transportation uh, authorities in the United States have, have categorized over five and a half trillion dollars of, of infrastructure needs. Um, so we have to be very careful in the level of rejoicing that we engage in when we see a specific proposal from this administration. But they certainly, one of the things they're talking about are tax credits for private investments, um, and that frankly is of very little consequence to the need. First of all, most of the infrastructure projects don't have revenues associated with them. When you build a school, or fix a road, or build a park, there's not a revenue associated with it, so there, there's no opportunity for Wall Street to invest money on a taxable basis, and tax credits only apply if it's a taxable loan. So it, it, it's, it's, it's very tempting, and I understand it, for politicians to try to figure out how we do infrastructure. But in the final analysis, unless there are revenues yeah. to service long-term debt, we, we're kidding ourselves in the thinking that we can continue to have a modern, up-to-date infrastructure. Do we run the risk also, if, if you're talking about trying to get more private capital, of, of in, effect, in effect privatizing public resources? So you know, there have been the, you know, the, the P3s, the public-private partnerships, some of which if not selling a public asset, a, a very long-term lease. And I know there have been cases in other states where, you know, let's say a toll road, and you mentioned backing up with revenues, and then uh, the deal sounds great until the tolls then go way up because the, the private investor needs the return, and then all of a sudden folks say, wait a minute, what happened? How come we're paying so much? Is it, could some of this be an agenda to privatize public resources? Uh, I, public it's certainly assets? a suspicion yeah. that's, that some of us have. And <clears throat> that is really very, very misleading for the reasons you point out. First of all, um, why, if you, if, you, if you were governor, which you may be one day, uh, why would you finance anything taxable if you could finance it tax exempt? You wouldn't. Um, and if it's going to be financed tax exempt, it is irrelevant to these infrastructure funds that the Wall Street firms have created. Mm. There are projects, I think, what what uh, the Port Authority is doing in LaGuardia Airport, for example, which is a P3, makes sense, but it's really the airlines that are paying for it. It's yeah. not the public that's paying for it. Yeah. And it is efficient because the prophylactic practices that a public agency has to engage in, um, because they have tough people auditing their books and reviewing their practices, um, takes longer than a, a private um, a company which doesn't have the same kind of, of vigorous oversight. So there are efficiencies and arguable cost savings in, in private activities. But when it comes to building a school or a park or a road or buying a bus or a subway car, there's no earthly reason in the world to finance that privately. Okay. Our audience are largely folks like you who live in Manhattan, and you did touch on uh, the MTA, and you, you chaired the MTA in a very challenging time, and you're given credit for saving it saving the subway system. Uh, what do you think about where we're at right now with the MTA? How do you, how do you see you know, the, some celebration of a Second Avenue subway line finally opening up? And as you mentioned, the capital plan was finally agreed to, although the financing remains somewhat problematic. Uh, there's a, a transition going on now, leadership-wise. Uh, I know you're a close watcher of all things MTA. It's very important to folks in Manhattan. Well, What's your view on where end, we're at? Well, first of all, I think there are two observations. One, the MTA. Uh, was created uh, to not remove 
uh, elected officials from the ultimate responsibility, but to remove them from the day-to-day -day decisions and the issues of fare increases, which is why the uh, public authority uh, law was created, and the people are appointed for fixed terms, um, and they're supposed to be independent. And there, in fact, was a law passed in uh, 2009 which reinforced the fiduciary uh, duty of a member of an independent public authority to the purposes of the authority rather than to uh, the person that appointed them. And I think the people who get appointed to these authorities should be very, very mindful of that responsibility. I think the MTA failed in that regard when they reduced the fares on the Veronzano Bridge and why they cut back their revenues was a breach of their fiduciary responsibilities. But I, I think that um, New York City is growing, as, as all cities are in this country, and our population is expanding. And um, I, I s stood at the 86th Street subway station uh, a couple of weeks ago and the, had to stand there as two trains passed because it was so crowded. So, full, yeah. so it was an enormous overcrowding. We have to go to a, a voice control signal system, uh, which is a big investment of capital dollars in order to have more throughput for our subway system. And that's going to be an increasing problem, as well as expanding. I mean, the, the virtue of the Second Avenue subway, it's very nice for all of us fortunate people who live on the east side of Manhattan. Uh, to reduce the congestion on the Lex line, but the real virtue of the Second Avenue subway was to open up the East Bronx for development, so that's a long time ahead of us. Yeah, but there's no doubt that the, the strength of the city's economy is, is tied to the viability of the public transit system. No question. And, and you know, we need to always keep in mind if we want to keep this economy moving in the, in the right direction, we can't shirk our responsibility to invest and reinvest in, in that very important asset. That's correct. Um, do you, do you have a sense of uh, optimism as to where we're at right now? There's a lot of signs the economy is mixed. Stock market's way up, but job growth is continuing but slowing to a certain extent. I've never been a good guesser about <laughs> the economy. I, I don't know. I think that um, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about which way this administration is going to move. Is it going to move in the traditional conservative Republican uh, view of emphasizing reducing deficits and reducing borrowing um, and cutting taxes for the rich or is it going to embrace some of the populist uh, ideas that were expressed during the campaign but we'll, we'll know more when we see the president's budget message. We'll have you back to talk about that. We're just about out of time. Dick, thanks so much for being with us and Pleasure sharing important, to be with you. important thoughts that I know our viewers are going to take a great interest in. We will be right back with my next guest, but I really want to thank again uh, former Lieutenant Governor Richard Ravitch for sharing his thoughts on infrastructure, state and local budgets, where we're headed as a nation, as a state, and obviously as New York City. One of Manhattan's most prominent citizens, Dick Ravitch. <music> My next guest was chosen by an overwhelming majority of voters in November to represent Manhattan's financial district, Chinatown, and the Lower East Side. Assembly Member Yulene Nu, thank you so much for joining us today on Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, when new folks come to Albany, people often refer to those who are viewed as uh, people who are going to make a big difference as rising stars, but it seems to me your star has already risen. You have more than hit the ground running representing Lower Manhattan, and uh, we wanted to have our Manhattan viewers get to know you a little better. Many of them are your constituents. I know you worked very hard to become the assembly member there, and why don't you just share with us what has been your impressions, your experience of the first uh, few weeks that you've been in office? Um, I've, I've actually really enjoyed um, being in Albany uh, with you know meeting my new colleagues and then understanding a little bit more about how things work as a member I was uh, Ron Kim's chief of staff for about um, four years and assembly member from Queens yes the assembly member from Queens he represents Flushing and you know I, I think that you know more and more I see um, you know how things uh, operate in and I'm able to plug in where I feel like my community needs a better voice. 
It's a little different being a staff person. I was a staff person once myself before being an elected official. So uh, there's certain things you can delegate, but when you're the elected official, you've got to be the one, you know, meeting with constituents, answering their concerns. You represent one of the most exciting districts, really, in the state, not just in New York City, and a, and a district that's really gone through tremendous transformations. We put out a report um, last fall about uh, the transformation of Lower Manhattan, really, because, especially uh, in the in the aftermath of the tragedy on 9/11 how we've seen uh, the, the neighborhood change, the, the uh, becoming much more residential, not just a commercial center anymore, uh, what that means in terms of it being a younger community as well, issues of school crowding, uh, issues for those who have been there a long time, senior issues, and I know that's been one of your big concerns. You're, you're the first Asian to represent Chinatown, which says something about the evolution of, of the community and, and the growing strength of the Chinese and the Asian community in New York City and in New York State. Uh, how do you keep up with, with all that? And, and, and share with us what your priorities are for your district. Sure. So my colleagues and I, we fight all the time about you know who has the best district. I <laughs> arguably have the best district. I mean, we have the best food. We have the best looking people. We have <laughs> amazing, vibrant um, economic growth. Um, I think that, uh, I think one of the, I think it's AM New York published um, that we literally tripled in population in lower Manhattan in just the last couple of years. And I think that it's really um, important to recognize that, you know, there's a residential shift. People are actually moving into financial district and Battery Park City a lot more. Um, but like you said, there's so many things that are um, needing attention. So, you know, we were also hit hardest by Hurricane Sandy. Yeah. Um, we need a lot of the revitalization, the resiliency efforts and all of that to happen. We still, you know, I know we have locked in funding from FEMA. We still need to draw that down and I think that that's really important on the state level. Um, one of the other things that we need to kind of focus on is that we know that we have a rapidly aging population. And like you mentioned, you know, seniors have been a huge part of the push and uh, priority in my agenda up in Albany. Um, right now, in the governor's budget, there's $17 million in cuts to senior centers. And that's going to be humongous because that's about 65 senior centers. Mm. Um, and I can't imagine what my seniors would do without their senior centers. We need them to stay active, right? Because that keeps folks out of, um, you know, hospitals and out of assisted living. And I think that, you know, NORCs are really important. Um, right now, there's seven hundred thousand dollars cut for NORCs. Um, that's Explain the NORC yeah. concept because <laughs> so, it's, I, I, I know the actors. We have yeah. a NORC where I live. But I think it's such an important concept that most people don't know about. So just explain a little more what, so, what it means and why you think it's so important we, yeah. we, we maintain that funding. Absolutely. So the a NORC is a natu is naturally occurring retirement communities. And so um, when you deem um, a c community a NORC, it, it means that people who are aging in place of, of like where, where they are living. So those were not um, set out to be retirement communities, but we put in programs and things like that that help to um, you know keep people in active in their communities and, and independent and independent and in their yeah. homes. And I think that that's so important. You know, um, NORCs are able to uh, you know they're they're amazing community organizations that are able to help folks to you know have lunches, um, be able to socialize, and um, you know just being able to have a bunch of friends is <laughs> so important yeah. for everyone. Yeah. I mean, for and you and me. And connected when they need a service, whether it's healthcare or you know yeah. whatever the kind of help may be, Absolutely. to know who to call and how to make a connection. And many of the times, you know, they'll bring in folks, like there's even like, um, you know, social workers who are there to do a mental health check, you know, be able to help with um, making sure that folks uh, have the SNAP benefits or SCREE benefits or, um, that, you know, any kind of forms that they need to fill out, um, even, even if they are moving towards um, trying to figure out, you know, whether or not they want to leave their community, then that's also somebody to help them to navigate that yeah. too. Yeah. So it's it's so important to have these NORCs. And, and the reason why, um, and right now, actually, I'm on a letter to, um, to get more funding in the budget, actually, $5 million more. I want more than just the $700,000, um, you know, put back into the budget, but I also am asking for $5 million more because I think that the programs have been so successful that um, we need to really be able to uh, fund all of the folks who are trying to um, be labeled as a NORC because I think that more and more organizations are seeing that they actually can qualify as a NORC. They're helping the senior population um, in a way that uh, will make it so that you know they can, they can qualify as a NORC, but the pool is 
shrinking yeah. um, for funding while the pool of folks who qualify as NORCs and should be getting that funding has been growing. Yeah. And of course, one reason why the population is growing is people are living a lot longer. Absolutely. So the need for these senior <laughs> services, it's a good thing. <laughs> thing. It's absolutely a good thing. Tell me, uh, do you get a lot of constituent um, concerns expressed on uh, New York City Housing Authority? Is NYCHA an issue in your district that you've been focusing on? Yeah, actually, um, my district has a huge amount of NYCHA um, housing, and so, you know, it's been uh, a huge priority of mine to make sure that we also get um, an extra amount of money in um, the budget. Right now, I'm part of a letter with Brian Kavanaugh, um, who is part of my neighboring, um, he's the, literally my neighboring assembly person, and we share a lot of, um, you know, the NYCHA properties on, um, on the waterfront. And I think that, um, you know, it's incredibly crucial for um, the roofs to be fixed, there's mold that people are breathing in. Mm. Um, people are actually living in I want to say like unlivable conditions in, in NYCHA and I think that it's our responsibility, um, the states and the cities and the federal government's responsibility to make sure that we are able to, um, you know, provide adequate and decent livable conditions for, for folks in, in NYCHA. Um, we're asking for $500 million right now um, because, you know, it's, it, it's critical that um, the funding not just, um, you know, go towards little pockets of buildings, but that we're doing actual capital infrastructure, um, you know, pushes and and fixes, and we're 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 trying to push to make sure that the funding doesn't just go, um, you know, and go waiting in an agency like like DASNY right now. It's yeah. it's just sitting there right now. So so. Um, we're, we're hoping that the funding will go directly to NYCHA, um, that they'll be able to f make the fixes much quicker, uh, because it's absolutely crucial. It, um, I mean, when, when you look at the numbers of like how much um, you know, we'll be paying in 20, 30 years or something like that, it's, 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 in, it's, it's literally um, unfixable, because if you are stacking up you know, without making the crucial fixes, uh, all the different costs, um, associated with letting these buildings um, start to dilapidate, mm. like it, it's, um, it doesn't make any sense. It'll that cost a lot more down the road to do when it's a cr when it's a real crisis. When although for some families, a crisis now. Yeah, I mean, I've literally seen families who are duct taping their seats yeah. back to their walls. That, yeah. That's not okay. It shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned the diversity of your district, and of course, in, in New York, we celebrate diversity uh, uh, in a very important way. Uh, the issue of immigration is a very hot issue right now nationally, uh, a lot of debate and concern. Uh, from your perspective, uh, given your family's history and the district you represent, how do you react to uh, some of the proposed changes that are coming out of Washington and what, what, what are the implications for us here in New York? I mean, um, with your previous guest, you were asking about the economy and I think that that's one of the things that people aren't talking about when they're talking about the immigration issue. We all know that America is um, more prosperous because of immigration. Um, and I think that if we are to have, um, you know, a stop of immigration to this country, I think that, you know, we would have a huge economic deficit. I think that people will experience it. Um, I mean, you probably heard a little bit of um, some of the bills that are going through uh, the state right now. Um, some of them, um, because of executive orders, people are talking about data registries and things like that. Um, we just, we need to make sure that um, we are not doing those things. I mean, I have mentors who, um, you know, lived through the Japanese internment, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Holocaust, yeah. and I think that, you know, that, you know, things that, Legislation and, and, and laws that deem any ethnicity or religious group or um, race or any particular group as enemies of the state, I think that that's really dangerous. I think that we've seen it happen already. We've seen it happen before. And I don't think that um, you know, any of us would say that what happened to the, the Japanese Americans during World War II was right. Mm. Nobody would say that the Chinese Exclusion Act mm. was right. Mm. Nobody would say that the, uh, the, the Holocaust was right and that, you know, people don't regret allowing Jewish refugees coming into the country. Mm. You know, like, I think that 
I think that we need to really examine our own history and look back and acknowledge the fact that you know we 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 did these things and we know it's wrong and that you know we don't want to repeat that mm. history. Yeah. I think that that's really crucial, and yet that's what's happening right now. And I think those executive orders um, have made it so that right now, more than ever, our states um, and our state legislatures and our state government are the front lines in guarding our, our rights. I mean, we saw what happened in Washington state. Um, you know, there was a, a fight in court and it, you know, the executive order was deemed unconstitutional. They're still trying to appeal, but yeah. you know, I think that these are the pushes that our states can make and um, continue to make to make sure that we are fighting for our, our rights and, and our constituents' yeah. rights. Well, you spoke very eloquently on, on the morality of the situation and you also started your comments by reminding us of the importance of the economy. You know, the, the workforce, something, we put out reports that shows over $270 billion in economic impact of immigrants in New York City, about 40% of the workforce born somewhere else. Uh, New York City, New York State, certainly one of the highest concentrations of immigrant population. Where would New York be without uh, immigrants and, and immigrant communities? And it also translates into, into population. You know, uh, some parts of our state have been losing population. Had we not had immigrants continuing to choose New York as home, our population would be way down. We're not growing as fast as other states, but it's the immigrant population that replenishes the ranks of, uh, of our neighborhoods. Some of the upstate communities, and we just talk about it in terms of city, but some of the upstate communities really that have been really hemorrhaging population, it's been the new immigrant groups, often that start out in the city and then they choose to move to other communities that have been bolstering uh, the strength of those neighborhoods. And that translates into political power. Before you know it, it's gonna be another census. And that's when the Absolutely. congressional map will be written and how, how many members of Congress each state will get is based on population. Where would New York be without the replenishment of our population by immigrants? And it's, it's your family story, it's my family story. Uh, how could we, as you said so beautifully, how could we forget our history, our own personal history, let alone the history of New York? And your voice, I think, is very important on that issue right now. Well, in my district, we're staring straight at the Statue of Liberty every day. Mm. And every day, that's the symbol of our United States. Yeah. And that's the symbol of what our nation's supposed to be, in yeah. a family of immigrants. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, and uh, with you being there, fighting the good fight, I have renewed confidence that we'll get through this. We're just about out of time. Assemblymember Yuli New, thank you for being thank our guest. So good luck as me. you're beginning your career in Albany. I know it's going to be a great career. And your Manhattan constituents should feel free to call your district office if they need help or they have any questions on any of the topics we talk about. Absolutely. Um, we're trying to make sure actually to um, have a district office in our district and that's, that doesn't require you to have ID to go upstairs. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, joining us. My uh, thanks again to our former Lieutenant Governor Richard Ravitch and Assemblymember Yuli New for sharing their knowledge. I hope these conversations have been informative to you. I'm New York State Controller. Tom DiNapoli, and thanks for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Mm -hmm.